Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron Dalen. I'm a pediatrician in Northwest Pediatric Center. Shockingly to my brain counting, I'm entering my 12th year of practicing down here. And uh, it's been a blessing. I can tell you a lot's changed with uh, concussion awareness and management uh, in that now near dozen years that I've been here. So uh, we'll kind of go through basically a medical take. I'll try to keep it brief. I know I'm the last speaker. I don't have, that was an awesome presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're stuck with just me talking. Got a couple handouts over there. But I just uh, kind of want to, want to go through the medical piece on uh, three issues, and then I can field a couple questions, or if you guys are probably ready to go home, we can turn it over to Matt and he can wrap it up. Um, so the, I guess, <clears throat> let me speak as the former football player first, okay? So we understand that it's a, it's a character building, potentially dangerous game, right? I mean, that's, that's reality. And we're, part of it is molding young men uh, into their potential as far as character and discipline and toughness, for lack of a better term. And so the, the challenge, I'll start with concussion. The challenge with concussion, right, is it, uh, please don't quote me on this, but it is kind of the pulled hamstring times a thousand, right? You can't really look at a kid's pulled hamstring and tell him or her that she doesn't have a pulled hamstring, right? If the kid limps and says, my hamstring hurts, okay, you got a pulled hamstring. It's not gonna swell like a knee necessarily. So we do have to look at the fact that with concussion, if you don't want to run conditioning that day and you say, I'm dizzy, we're stuck, right? And I just want to acknowledge that, okay? I don't, I played, I played high school, I played college ball, so I've been there. And so I just, if no one's put that out there, I just want to put it on the table, shoot straight, okay? We do have to, we do have to acknowledge that, that if a kid is having a tough day or doesn't want to do that drill or mom made him come out and he doesn't want to be here, if he claims dizzy and headache and says it started when we did, you know, when we did form tackling drill, you're kind of stuck. So it, it is, the motto is when in doubt, sit him out, okay? And that is just the medical side of me I jumped to there, the reality. But I, you know, acknowledging that one, if you want to come up with concussion symptoms, just as our colleague was saying back there, you know, we're working on tests, but certainly nothing you're going to do on the field. It's, it's subjective. It's reported. I mean, yeah, you can see it, right? I mean, some kids, they take a hit. He, get, he gets up. He's spinning backwards. You know it. And it, if you watch football a while, I mean, especially on HD, you can see when the quarterback stands up. And if you look in his eyes and the pupils are about that big, and it's pretty clear he's trying to look like he knows where he's at, but he doesn't. I mean, sometimes you can see it, but the reality is it's symptom presentation, okay? Um, the, the other piece is challenging, right? So if Jimmy got up at 10 o'clock, ate a bag of Cheetos and drank two Mountain Dews and showed up for practice at two with, you know, when it's 90 degrees out, is Jimmy gonna end up with a headache? Is Jimmy gonna feel dizzy? You know what I mean? That, that you're, these concussion symptoms are tough, right? Just as our colleague was saying, dehydration is similar. Out of shape is similar, right? I guarantee you, when I did no summer conditioning before my sophomore year in high school, I got dizzy and headaches and everything, and we were and, and we were just in sweats. We weren't hitting anybody, okay? I was just trying to make it up and down the field once, okay? Same thing, right? You put an eighth grader in a helmet for the first time, he's going to have head pain, right? That's just, I mean, you're, you're hauling this thing on your head. Your neck's going to be, you're, I mean, your neck's going to be tired, okay? So not, I just want to acknowledge, not all head pain, and I get this as a doctor, not all head pain is concussion. Not all headache is concussion. Not all dizziness is concussion. Not all neck soreness is concussion. Not all stomach ache, right? Not all nausea is concussion. Not all moodiness is concussion. But these are all symptoms that we have to honor, and especially referencing our culture and appropriately medically being safe, when in doubt, you got to pull them out. Okay, but I just, I want to put that on the table for coaches before I get going here. Um, as I've referenced, right, I, I brought the list. Uh, there, there are 22 different things, symptom-wise, that we evaluate for at our clinic, on a, just on a subjective screen. If we don't have, you know, obviously if we've got, if we've got pre-test, post-test, that gives us much more objective information, but we often don't. So I've got, I've got the reported symptoms, right? So as I was reading here, pressure in the head, okay? Dizziness, nausea, vomiting, headache, 
blurred vision, balance problems, sensitivity to light and noise, feeling slowed down or in a fog, don't feel right, right? And the parents always joke when we get to these, more emotional irritability, and they'll say compared to what, right? Because it's a teenager. So, I mean, these are tough, but these are symptoms that we have to honor. So, I mean, we got this physical symptoms, right? As I've talked about, the cognitive symptoms, right? The kid's having a tough time remembering something or you're just worried. And then, right, remember the mood symptoms. Those are weird. Remember Luke Keekley last year, two years ago, when he got concussed and was bawling coming off the field like he couldn't control himself? You're going to see emotional changes. You'll see, I've seen guys laughing for no apparent reason. Um, and, and so being aware of that process, but medically, if you're, if you're concerned, any concern, right, unless, you, unless you're very comfortable otherwise, when in doubt, pull them out, okay? One, one quick sideline trick, there are, nothing's diagnostic, okay? But we're understanding more and more that balance and ocular muscle, uh, eye muscle and eye tracking is affected more specifically by concussion than we used to think, okay? So, I mean, there's, this, there's a basic test called the thumb test where you have them stare at, your, at their own thumbnail and turn their head back and it hurt, I mean, my vestibular system's garbage because I played so long. Well, I'm old and I played for a while but trying to hold that thumb and go faster and faster, okay? Or put up two fingers and have them quickly bounce back and forth and you're watching their eyes. If that makes them dizzy, makes them stick, they're, they're reluctant to do it, or you see the eyes start to pulse horizontally, we're done. I mean, that, if, you've got, if you've got a savvy athlete who's bright, who's really trying to stay in the game, run, run her or run him through that one. Chances are if there's a concussion, they're not gonna do well with that. And so that's just a little sideline. Don't quote me on that, but it works. Um, the clearance protocols, so I'm the gatekeeper, right? So there are five of us with the Washington Interstate Athletic Association, WIA, right? MD, uh, DO, PA, ARMP, and a trainer, okay? And so the, I mean, the idea of having a set protocol for return for school is great, but we, we're in an area with smaller schools. Not everybody's got a trainer who can, who can put it through. So a lot of this comes through, our parents are concerned, run through us as providers. And so just to be aware, and we, we're trying to global, I mean, at Northwest Beach, we try to be really good about this globally, right? Just as we were saying, if, if Jimmy got diagnosed with a concussion on Saturday, the ER note or the clinic note or the anybody note shouldn't say clear to return on Monday, right? It's a five or six day return to play plan. Uh, with progressively more challenging activities. Um, and some of the stuff you wouldn't think, one thing I've learned in the last few years, something like volleyball players trying to track the ball coming over their head, align themselves with it, follow it down and hit it, you can be great otherwise with your concussion and that will tweak them out. And they, they don't recover well from it. So little balance in tracking an eye and vestibular symptoms uh, can't hang on. So that's why we're slow to go. That's why you might be running more but the skill set or the balance or the, the kind of eye-hand coordination or eye tracking, that's all stuff we have to keep watching. And we trust you all. We trust the trainers. We gotta trust the kids too. Because it's so subjective, they've gotta to report to us you know, symptoms. So my return to play plan, I'm not gonna bring them in every day for a $35 copay to say, hey Jimmy, how was your head today at practice? Great, go back out there, right? We gotta, we gotta track this as a team collectively and if, if Jimmy has symptoms or you see Jimmy with symptoms, you gotta stop, hold, go back a day and have them call our office and then we'll kind of work it from there. But we do, we do wanna honor the fact that we're now learning that the long-term effects of untreated concussion are, cause big problems. Now, on a side note there, the whole CTE piece, until they tease out uh, you know, substance use and steroid use and alcohol and other things, it, it, it's big, big media market, but we really don't understand exactly what all plays into it. So you may get parents asking about CTE. I, th I think right now, I don't wanna over speak about it and be guilty of what I'm gonna accuse others of, but we wanna, we wanna know it's there, but tread lightly. But uh, the, you know, the big picture is recurrent untreated concussions are not good for you and have long-term effects that we want to avoid. Um, so I guess the big point I want to leave with concussion, right? If you're worried, sit them out, have them come see a, an appropriate provider, get that five to six day return to play plan, make sure we do it right, help them track, help them you know, assess themselves and let us know if things are not progressing as we thought they would. 
Um, second step, or second thing step, second thing I want to talk about, nice day when it's 97 degrees outside to talk about it, heat and hydration. Okay, and these, these are, I was, I like to lose weight at practice because it made me feel better about myself. So I was not, I was not an optimally hydrating athlete at any point. But when you, when you look at the recommendations, they got about 30 handouts over there. Uh, so one, you're shooting for about a milliliter per calorie consumed per day. So if you've got a kid who's a 2,500 to 3,000 calorie a day eater, which is probably about typical for uh, you know, a, a high activity, uh, some may be more, but junior high to high school athlete, you're talking about 12 eight ounce cups per 24 hours just at baseline. And then you wanna get two more cups of fluid in them before about two hours before practice, six to 12 ounces right at the start. And then yeah, the, the medical recs are a water break every 20 to 30 minutes. And more water if it's hot, obviously. Now granted, that's if we're, if we're talking two a days in this heat, different than Thursday sweats practice, right? I mean, that's, it, I'm talking real, you know, you don't have to give them water every 20 minutes when you're trying to install a game plan in the gym and it's 70 degrees and everybody's walking, okay? But when you're out really sweating in the sun every 20, 30 minutes, so keep that in mind, and I, I mentioned to a mom that I was doing this, great wisdom from mom. She's like, hey, remind those guys, have a bathroom available, because the reality, I mean, if, the, if have somewhere the kids can go, because if you're really hydrated, you might not, not every kid's gonna make it two hours without having to pee. So just logistically something to think about. Um, there's also, oh, one more note. So sports strengths, nobody needs a sports drink when it's 50 degrees, and you're, you're 30 minutes into playing third base in Little League, okay? You, you don't need Gatorade for that. Sports strengths come into play after 60 minutes of sweat and, and exertion, okay? So no, nobody, needs, nobody needs Gatorade for the walkthrough. Uh, I mean, it tastes good, but you, you don't need the sugar, you don't need the salt. But when you hit that hour plus mark of exertion, having fluid with electrolytes and with glucose, and whether you do that with Water and orange slices and pretzels, that's fine, or you do it with a sports drink. But that's where they come into play, after an hour of real work. Um, then you can start incorporating, not exclusively, but some sports strength into what you're drinking. Um, next handout I've got over there kind of teases out the difference between uh, heat exhaustion and heat stroke, okay? So heat exhaustion is you pull them from practice, you pull the pads off, you put ice on their neck, wrists, and behind their knees. You get them water, you put them in the shade. They should be fine. Okay, heat stroke is a 911 call, okay? So obviously, not a subtle discrepancy there. And again, it, it, the, but unfortunately, the symptom differences can be subtle. But, you know, for, I mean, for all, the, the, um, for all those kids, as you're running through, right? I mean, it's the same stuff, even concussion, fatigue, headache. Um, you can get, you know, the heat exhausted kids will get thirsty, they'll get cramps, okay? They will sweat more. So big things, just to keep in mind, and I want to keep this brief if I've done that. Um, things to look at with heat stroke, okay? Confusion and fainting, breathing issues, and it's hot, but they stop sweating. You'll get this dry, kind of heated pink flush skin that, that feels almost leathery. That's, that's, that's time to get the paramedics involved because that kid, for one reason or another, has tipped over and now we're looking at needing IV fluids now. And so hopefully that won't be an issue if we're ahead of ourselves with hydration and appropriate management with heat and weather. But those are the big things. If you've got a conf confused passing out kid with breathing issues and they've stopped sweating even though it's hot and they've been working, that's, that's a big deal. Um, the last piece I wanna talk about, um, just the, the scary deal with sudden cardiac issues, okay? Um, I guess I, I term this best as we're talking about conditioning and heat. Okay, the flop versus the drop, right? There were many times I flopped in practice, right? So I'm on my third 100 yard sprint and I've decided it'd be better to die. So I, I take, you know, I slow down, I stagger, right? And then I flop over and I'm laying there totally conscious, breathing healthy, uh, breathing, breathing quickly, but I'm talking, I'm good, okay? That's a flop. That's probably a conditioning issue or, and you, I mean, I was one of them, you know your kids that were more prone to flop, okay? Now the drop is a kid who's in the middle of an activity or just finished an activity, but there's no taper down, there's no difference. That kid 
down they go, okay? And you get over there and they're not responsive, okay? So at that point, it's a pulse check. And if it's, you know, if it's way off or irregular or not there, right, that's a 911 call, initiate CPR and get an AED if you've got one available, okay? And I'll be honest with you, I'm a doctor. In an emergency, I want an EMT or a paramedic around, okay? So, it, and, and that's me. So the, the biggest step, if you're acutely worried about a kid being in bad shape, for all we learn about CPR, which is great, and AEDs, which are great, and all the other steps I talked about, cooling and hydrating and getting pads off, if you've got a kid in crisis or you're worried might be in crisis, the 911 call is the most important first step to get the paramedics over there and, and get them involved, okay? Uh, I think... I mentioned I've got the hydration handouts and the heat stroke versus heat exhaustion handouts. And uh, yeah, with a drop error on the side of caution, that's the last thing I put in there. Uh, oh, big important thing. The last cardiac piece, and we hopefully, I mean this, we've seen it bore out, hopefully not common, but a cervical spine injury uh, can cause, uh, if you injure the right part of the, the uh, cervical spine or the cervical cord can corrupt your your heart rate and breathing and so if you know otherwise I mean if you if you've got a kid you're that dropped but no injury right helmet off I mean you're trying to get him open exposed or her and assessed as quickly as possible but obviously any concern for a cervical injury and related breathing and heart the helmet stays in place we try to get the face mask off so we can intervene but being careful with the neck that was a lot of me talking are there questions I can try to answer? All right, you're either sick of listening to me or it's been too long or I, I hit things okay. All right, here's awesome. Matt. All right, thank you, thank you. yeah, you bet.